You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. And that which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God. The Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the Word of God says I am. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's Word is being confirmed in my life with signs following in Jesus name and amen praise the Lord and amen turn your Bibles please to mark the 11th chapter mark chapter 11 I'm teaching on the subject of why faith and when we speak about the word faith, oftentimes people have made mistakes of thinking faith means your denominational persuasion. That means, you know, what denomination you've come from or have been brought up in. Sometimes people think that when you mention the word faith, you're talking about Catholic, Baptist, Episcopalian, or are you talking about Lutheran? We're not talking about a denominational persuasion. We're talking about faith that touches the heart of God the Father and that pleases God and gets results in our lives. So we're talking about faith, why faith, and here we're going to be looking at Mark the 11th chapter to begin with, and then we'll move to other aspects in scripture concerning why faith. Mark chapter 11, let's look at verse 12. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. He was referring to Jesus. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, would you please circle the word uh, here in verse 14 where it says it, the first part where it says it, where it says, and Jesus answered and said unto it. So circle the word it. That means Jesus is literally talking to a fig tree. And he said this to the fig tree, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And notice the latter part of verse 14, and his disciples heard it, which meant that he was not just saying it under his breath or he wasn't saying it at all out loud. He literally was saying it loud enough so his own disciples could hear it. And it's interesting to note, if you were a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, what would you do if you were walking with him, you had the responsibility of being with him, you've left all to follow him, now you're with him and he is the prophet of Nazareth, he is the Christ, the one who's been acknowledged by John the baptizer as the Lamb of God sent to take away the sin of the world and here you are following Jesus the prophet. And he goes to talking to a fig tree. How does that make you feel when you've left everything and you're walking with him? You could get the impression that, you know what, maybe I need to rethink this. I mean, I've left everything. I'm here. I've got a family. I've got children. I've got a wife. I've got responsibilities. And I've left to follow the master. And the master is over here talking to a fig tree. Now, wouldn't that cause you to think that, hey, look, you know, um, uh, he's a little different. <laughs> well, Jesus, I believe, has the insight from the Holy Spirit.
desire from God to talk to the fig tree because God the Father wanted Jesus to be able to be an example of how faith works at the level where his disciples would ask him or question him. Now, here we have in Mark the 11th chapter, verse 14, and Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. A question, uh, he, he had to what? Answer and say unto it, how do you answer something that doesn't have lips? How do you answer something that doesn't have a vocal cord or expression or a throat? So Jesus is talking to a fig tree because the Bible says, and he answered and said unto it. Now let's read the previous verse of scripture that may help you. Look at verse 11. Mark the 11, verse 11. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. You there with me? Yes. Okay. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto, the, unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it. So what was he answering? Basically, the fig tree was saying, I'm not giving you what you came to receive from me. Jesus came to the fig tree to get some figs, but the fig tree was in essence saying by its circumstance, uh, you're disappointed. You're not going to get out of me what you came to get. And the fig tree by its circumstance was speaking so much so to Jesus that Jesus operated in faith and spoke to the fig tree and declared something concerning the fig tree. And what was that that he said? No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. Now skip over, because we're going to be moving forward in Mark the 11th chapter, in verse 19 now, skip to verse 19, because we know after Jesus spoke to the fig tree and his disciples heard it, he went into Jerusalem, went into the temple, and he had activity there in the temple, but then he's leaving the next day in verse 19, and when even was coming, when out of the city and in the morning as they passed by they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots and Peter calling to remembrance said unto him master behold the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away and Jesus answering said unto them have faith in God now, if you don't have that underlined in your Bible, I'd like for you to underline it because Jesus is speaking and it's in red letters in my Bible because God wants all of us to understand that his statement is to all of us, not just to his disciples that were with him, but to all of us here now present in this day. And that is have what? Faith in God. Now, let us be aware that I have a number two that says, look to the margin of your Bible, and in the teacher's edition, it says, or it could be stated this way in the original Greek language, it could read this way, or have the faith of God. So it could read, have faith in God, or it could have, read this way, or have the faith of God. Or we could say it this way, have faith or be in possession of the God kind of faith. And when Jesus says have faith, he tells us to be the kind of recipient that says, you're telling me I don't have it, but I need to have it. So because you told me I need to have it, then I best be having it. <laughs> Got that? So everybody say this, Jesus told me to have faith in God, to have the faith of God, or to have the God kind of faith. 
All right. So now, when Jesus says to have this faith, that must mean that this faith that he told us to have is capable of being identified. It's capable of being acknowledged. And when this kind of faith is present, it is obvious that this kind of faith is what was responsible for what Jesus did to the fig tree. So that means when we look at what's going on here, because Peter asked Jesus, Jesus, look at the fig tree which you cursed yesterday. You would expect then that Peter wants a response. Peter wants an explanation. This fig tree had green leaves on it yesterday, and yes, it didn't have any figs on it, but the green leaves meant that it was supple, it was alive, it just didn't have any fruit on it. So now Jesus, why is this fig tree dried up from the roots? The very life source of the fig tree has been cut off. And this fig tree is withered away. I mean, it, normally if it was going to die from being, let's say, uh, exposed to a traumatic weather condition, it would still take some time. But this fig tree died overnight. And this fig tree died from the root system up, not from the leaves dropping off and then down to the root system. So the very life source of the fig tree has been cut off and is no longer giving it life. And the fig tree responded to that life source being cut off so much that the whole thing is withered away. What's going on? So Peter wants an explanation because he sees what one would call a phenomenon. He sees something that literally has taken place and he traces back in his mind the only interaction that I know we've had of this fig tree is when Jesus spoke to it yesterday. So now Jesus, I want to know why is this fig tree dead like that? Now Jesus says, unto them as well as unto us have faith in God or have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith. So could we conclude then that the God kind of faith is responsible for what happened to the fig tree? Could we all conclude that based upon what we're reading? Correct? Okay. Now then, let us look at verse 23 because verse 23 explains the operation of the God kind of faith. Now, it was necessary at the beginning that I said when we use the word faith, it is not the word denominational persuasion. We're talking about now the word faith, meaning that you have confidence, trust, you have reliance upon, and not anything, but you have reliance, confidence, trust, reliance upon God and his ability. And this ability that we're to have in God is that God operates by faith. And since God operates by faith and God uses faith to get his results, then we as the people of God should be operating by the God kind of faith. Because we are the people of God and the disciples at that time that were walking with Jesus Jesus, they would be considered as those who are followers of God because Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. Jesus was the word incarnate and Jesus was the, lo was the logos. He was the word of God literally walking among them. So they now were considered as people who were devoted and committed to God. Now they wanted results. And don't you want results in your life? Don't you want to have the power of God operating in your life? Well, then you're going to have to get results by the same way Jesus received results, by the same way he told his disciples to be in possession where they could have results. We then, who live in the 21st century, are told the same thing. Be in possession of the God kind of faith. 
Why? Because the God kind of faith gets results all the time. Now here's the explanation of how the God kind of faith works in verse 23. For verily, that means faithfully, truthfully, I say, this is Jesus talking, I say unto you. And you could put your name there. I could put my name where, where it says you. He's actually re he's talking to me. Everybody say, you is referring to me. Okay, so now since Jesus is talking directly to you, I don't want you to see this as a verse of scripture that was, that was applicable back in that day only about 2,000 years ago and say, well, you know what? This is a historical document. It is real. And so therefore, I'm just going to go by this historical document and say the God kind of faith worked then. But no, he's telling us the God kind of faith works when? Yeah. Now. Now, so if people aren't getting results, if people aren't getting the faith of God in operation, who's responsible for that? According to this, he told us to be in possession of the God kind of faith. That means if I'm not in possession of the God kind of faith, I need to do what? I need to be in possession of the God kind of faith. And it must be possible that I can have the God kind of faith in operation because he wouldn't tell me to have something that it wasn't possible for me to have. He wouldn't tell me to have possession of something that I could never possess. So therefore, he told me to have the God kind of faith. Verse 23 he explains how the God kind of faith, he says, For well, verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, some people have read this verse of scripture and have gotten into a place where they, uh, they attempted to make it say what they have now adopted in life. Meaning that feelings are to rule above all that you say. In other words, pay attention to feelings. So even sometimes people describe themselves as, you know, body and soul. They don't even talk about spirit. They just say body and soul, body and soul. But you are more than body. You are more than the soul. You are a spirit. And because you are a spirit, the word heart is referring to your spirit. He's not referring to the blood pump. He's referring to your spirit. Everybody say this. My spirit is referred to in the Bible as my heart. Now, when he talks about the heart, he's talking about the center and the core of you. Oftentimes, people, I know like my wife, she enjoys watermelon and she really enjoys cold watermelon. And before they really developed, you know, seedless watermelons, you'd have to go through the seeds to get to the part where the heart of the melon had just flesh. It was just juicy watermelon. And so my wife would always go right to the heart of the melon. She'd go right there. Now everybody else can have whatever is left. <laughs> but when it, when it got down to my wife and her watermelon, it was all about the heart of the melon. And so I always deferred to her when I knew I got a watermelon, I knew she was going after the what? The very center, the very heart, the very core of the melon. So now when we see the word heart, I want you to think about, he's talking about your spirit, the center and the core of you. He's talking about the real you. The real you is a spirit. You have a soul, that's your mind, your will, and your intellect, and the real you lives inside of a physical body. And because you are a tripartite being, tri meaning three-part being, then when Jesus uses the word believe in your heart, he's not talking about believe with your head. He's not talking about believe with your feelings and emotions. He's talking about believing right down in the center and core of you. 
So sometimes people think, well, how can I embrace in my heart, but my head keeps giving me challenges. I must not believe in my heart. Or you can believe something in your heart that your head really has challenges with. You can believe in your heart and embrace the promises of God right down in here. And your physical body may not like it at all. The Bible says flee fornication. Your body's like, oh, I ain't trying to hear that. But see, the real you that lives down in here, you got to make your body obey what's in your heart from the word of God. Because the real you is a spirit. And because you are a spirit, the Bible describes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The beholding of all things have become new is referring to, look, you need to, Gary. I'm talking about me now. You believer, believe this. You, meet, you need to check out how you received a new nature you are a new creature and you have new abilities that you didn't have before. Another scripture, a uh, translation of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new species. You are a new species. That means you are, you are a creature that never existed before. You are now born with the nature and the ability of God on the inside of you. So since God's power dwells on the inside of you, then you need to learn how to walk where God's power can be used on the circumstances of life that you have to deal with. But the way you release God's power to work on the circumstances of life has to be the same way that Jesus released the power of God on the fig tree. So we're going to look at Mark eleven twenty three 23 again. He says, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. So whosoever shall what? Say. say. Now, whosoever, who's, who's he talking to when he says whosoever? We could say it this way. Whosoever means me. So I fit into the category of whosoever. So he's talking to me, Gary. To me, he says that whosoever, that's me, shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the see and shall not doubt in his heart or we could substitute the word heart with what spirit and shall not doubt in his spirit or heart but shall believe where now where am I to believe in my heart in my spirit but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he saith notice he didn't say whatever you feel Because your feelings are subject to change. Keep your marker here and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. See, your feelings are subject to change. So if you go by feelings only, then you'll always be vacillating going back and forward based upon how circumstances look. If circumstances look dark, then you'll act dark. If circumstances look bleak, you'll act bleak. If circumstances look like it's not going to work for you, you'll be like, ah, oh, I guess I'm just a victim of the circumstances. See, if you go by feelings or if you go by sight or your sensory evidence that comes from your five senses, you'll always be a person wishy-washy. You'll never be consistent and you'll never get results with the power of God because the results come from the faith of God that Jesus told us to be in possession of and being in possession of the God kind of faith operates by Mark 11, 23 and 24. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Are you there? He said, but I keep under my body. Who's I? This is the apostle Paul talking to believers and he lets us know he said but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection notice he uses the word my body that means you ought to consider your body as what you possess you are the master of your body 
You are the one who are supposed to tell your body how to act, how to respond, how to get results. You're to tell your body what's going on. You don't let your body tell you what's going on. Are you with me? And some people have gotten that fact clear in their walk with the Lord. And they think that the way I feel is the way things really are. And see, feelings can lead you astray. Your body can play tricks on you. Your body may not want to cooperate with you. And your body can become an enemy to you, which is in your heart. Consequently, you are never, I always say this, never turn your back on your body. Never turn your back on your body. Why? Because your body has different other feelings than what your spirit may say. Now, Paul the Apostle said this, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That means if I don't allow, if I don't pay attention to, if I don't check my body, my body could disqualify me from having a a real testimony for Christ if I do what my body tells me to do you know what I wouldn't be a good representative for Jesus why because my heart is different than my body and my body is different than my heart my spirit my heart is born of the nature of God but my body is not changed yet turn over the Thessalonians turn over to the right of, of where you are in first Corinthians turn over to first Thessalonians Chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll start at verse 16. See, if you're going to operate in victory as a Christian, you must learn to walk by faith and not by sight. You have to learn how to develop in faith, how to know and identify the God kind of faith when it's in operation and understand that the God kind of faith is not in possession by everybody. Everybody should be able to have the God kind of faith, but everybody may not be in possession of the God kind of faith because we recognize from scripture that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 17 but here we are looking at at first Thessalonians chapter 5 if you have it say praise the Lord let's look at verse 16 it says rejoice evermore pray without ceasing and everything give thanks in everything he didn't say for everything and that's a big difference when he says in everything versus for everything some people think that everything that happens is God doing it and if everything that happens is God doing it, why is there a conflict that we can read clearly in Scripture? If the fig tree not having any figs was God, why would Jesus curse the fig tree and it dies? Apparently, the fig tree not having any figs was not pleasing to God, right? Therefore, Jesus had something to say to the circumstance that was not in line with what he desired. So everything that happens is not from God. And people need to really recognize that because knowing that everything that happens is not from God puts you in position to say, all right, let me find out from God's word what is his will and then, re and then stay with the will of God and then resist everything that is not the will of God. Are you with me? See, if everything was the will of God, the fig tree would have been okay with Jesus, even though it didn't have any figs. If everything was the will of God, when, he, when Jesus left the fig tree and went into Jerusalem and went into the synagogue and they were in there having a gambling casino, Jesus would have said, hey, look, it's all good, baby. It's all good. But he didn't. Why? Because the gambling casino was not the place for it to be in church or in the synagogue. And Jesus turned over the tables, made a cord, made a whip out of cords and start beating people and wouldn't let anybody move anything. Why? Because he was upset. I, we can't say that he was not upset. 
And there are some people that think, well, Jesus was so smooth with everything. He was just, you know, he, he just, he just, hey, come on, guys. Stop gambling now in church. Stop gambling in the synagogue. No, no, no. Jesus turned everything over and turned that place upside down. And he explained why. Because he said, my father's house should be known as the house of prayer. But y'all have made it a den of thieves. That means thieves are feeling good up in here. They're teaching you all how to go the wrong way, and you're supposed to learn how to get results the right way. And see, it's obvious he didn't agree with it because he, he started beating people. <laughs> Could you all agree with that? Okay, so everything is not pleasing to God. And people need to recognize as Christians, you don't let the devil try to get you to substitute words where the Bible clearly says here, in everything, verse 18, in everything give thanks, not for everything. Everybody, let's read it out loud together. In everything give thanks. Okay. In everything, that means whatever it is I'm dealing with, I'm going to give thanks be unto God. Why? Because I know what to do in line with his will, and I know when something is of God, and I also when, know when something is not of God. But because I'm able to rejoice in the Lord in everything, that means that I'm not a victim of circumstances. That means I'm a ruler and I can change circumstances. See, when you know you have power, then you don't mind rejoicing. Are you with me? Yes. Now I have a cousin that is 10th degree grandmaster martial art expert. There's very few in the world. And, some, and he was talking about uh, how a person tried to challenge him. And he just walked away from him. Why? See, you can smile and walk away from somebody you can dismantle in two seconds. Are you with me? You can smile and, and leave and walk away from that person. Why? Because they don't have a clue as to what they just, they, they, they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue as to what could happen to them. They could have been, their life source could have been stopped with one hit, one blow. Before they hit the ground, they could have been dead and had broken parts. I know what I'm talking about because I've taken lessons from them. So my point being is this, when you know you're in position of authority, when you know you're in position where, where you have the God kind of faith and you can do something about circumstances, when you're facing a difficulty, you're like, praise the Lord, glory to God, hallelujah, why? Because I know I can get changes. I know that I can change this. I know that I can speak God's word and I can operate in the God kind of faith that gets results. So why would I trip out? Why would I say, woe well, is me and act like a victim when I know I can do something about it? Another example of that, remember when Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship? He was asleep and the ship was now full of water and the winds and the waves were coming against the ship and the disciples were like, Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? We're going to Paris. We're going to Paris. He didn't say, whoo, I wonder what's going on. I guess we are. Everybody, let's hold hands and pray. That's not what he did. Mm -mm. No, he got up and he said to the winds and the waves, peace be still. And the Bible says, and there was a great calm. That means the waters became placid, laid down, the winds stopped, and all the waves that were coming, and the winds that were coming against the, the ship there, all that stuff stopped. And you know what the disciples did? They looked at Jesus and said, what kind of man is this? And he looks at them, and then he says to them, why boys, you know how good, cool I am. No, that's not what he did. You know what he said? Where was your faith? How come you didn't get these results? How come you didn't get the changes that needed to be made? When do you start becoming subjected to and act like you're the one under the circumstances and let the circumstances govern your life? When are you going to start rising up and take control over situations and circumstances that don't line up with what God has already told you and revealed unto you? And his disciples, you know what their response was to Jesus? 
What kind of man is this? Ooh, look at what he can do. But see, Jesus was looking at them like, you were made in the likeness and the image of God. You're supposed to do these things. You were made in the likeness and the image of God. And you're supposed to have the power of God operating in your life. You're not some pushover. You're not supposed to be acting like, well, whatever happens just happens. For example, verse 18, people have said, instead of in everything give thanks, they've been saying, for everything give thanks. I guess it's the will of God. It must be the will of God for what is coming against me. It must be God doing it. If everything is God doing it to you, then why would you pray for a different circumstance? And people will trip out. I mean, they don't even use the same logic when it comes to sickness and disease. Because if sickness and disease comes to you from God, why would you be engaged in fighting cancer if cancer was the will of God? And people are constantly given to cancer, fight cancer, fight multiple sclerosis, fight all these diseases. Well, then if all those diseases came from God, why would you fight them? Even, and those are people that don't even have the God kind of faith. They just like, look, we recognize this is taking people out and we're going to get together and we're going to stop this and do research for it and we're going to shut this down. Why? Because they recognize sickness and disease is not good for you. But then there are those Christians who have accepted the wrong words that Satan replaces in their mind when it comes to scripture and they start talking about, well, I guess God is teaching me something. God is really showing me something. He put this on me to teach me a lesson. Huh? People that don't even know the Lord know better than that. How is it that you don't know better, oh Christian? You're supposed to be informed. It says here, in everything, in verse 18, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you? That no matter what you face, you still maintain a joyful attitude in God because you can make some changes. And all the people of God said, amen. amen. Now, verse 19, notice this. He tells you what don't do in verse 19. He says, quench not the spirit. The word quench means don't extinguish, don't shut down the spirit of God. Don't push down and oppress or depress or contain and shut down the spirit of God that's on the inside of you. Why? Because the spirit of God on the inside of you wants to rise up and deal with the things that are not the will of God. But how do you shut it down? How do you shut down, quench the spirit? By speaking contrary to what the spirit of God is telling you to do. See, people don't understand that the power of God, the power of God wants to move through you. It's not by your own might. It's not by your own power. It's by his spirit that he deals with things. But in order for that to happen, you've got to allow the spirit of God on the inside of you to do what? To come up and out. And that happens by your cooperation with the God kind of faith law. And the God kind of faith law says this, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say into this mountain be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in your heart but shall believe that those things which you say will come to pass you're going to have whatsoever you say so that means I'm going to have to be willing to speak to the mountain I'm going to have to be willing to speak to the fig tree I'm going to have to be willing to speak to the circumstance that does not line up with the will of God for me now if I don't speak to the circumstance, then what am I doing? I'm quenching, depressing, putting down the Spirit of God that wants to move on the circumstance. He says, quench not the Spirit. Don't you stop the Spirit of God that wants to operate in and through you. And then he says in verse 20, and despise, despise not prophesying. That means others that have a, a move of God on the inside of them that's speaking forth encouraging words in line with God's word. God's word that is given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. He says, don't you stop others that are speaking to you the wonderful promises of God. 
And you know that there are people that they get mad at those that speak the promises of God. For example, in Numbers, I believe it's the 13th chapter, in the Numbers of the 13th chapter, the, the spies went into Canaan's land to see what it was like. They saw that it was filled with fruits and vegetables and pomegranates and houses and lands and they got, saw gardens and everything was laid out and God said, go in there and take the land. It's the land that flows with milk and honey. I brought you out of Egypt to get you to go in there and dwell in places you didn't even have to build yourself. Go in there and live good. God says, go. And he sent the spies, 12 spies, one person from each tribe of Israel, a leader of Israel, to go in and spy out the land and then come back and tell Moses what you saw. And they went in there and they saw all these goodies and they brought back evidence of palm granites and clusters of grapes and they were so big and so juicy and so bountiful, they put it on poles and brought it on their shoulders back to the nation of Israel that were in the wilderness. And they saw it. And they started describing out of the 12 spies, 10 of them started describing how bad the circumstances were, meaning that there's giants in the land. Man, there's all kind of opposition that we're going to have to face because these people really enjoy where they're living. And God already said, I have given it unto you wherever the soles of your feet have tread. That have I given unto you for an inheritance. And they were like, no, we can't do it. And Joshua and... and uh, Caleb said, no, shut up, stop talking, stop talking. Why? Because their conversation of negativity was, according to what we see in Thessalonians, it was what? Quenching, extinguishing, pushing down, containing, limiting the power of God. And Joshua and Caleb, Caleb says, be quiet, be quiet, don't say anything else. He says, we're well able to take the land. If God is pleased with us, and he is, then let's go in and take it at once. They are just going to have to deal with the fact that we're coming in and we have God on our side. And you know what the 10 responded? The 10 responded and said, we can't take the land. And notice this. Their statement, we can't take the land, was in response to what Joshua and Caleb were saying. Joshua and Caleb were repeating the promise of God, and the ten were, we're going to shut you up, and we're going to kill you, and we're going to kill Moses, and we want to go back into Egypt. But see, the thing is, you got on this side of the Red Sea because the Red Sea was parted. How are you going to get back? <laughs> But see, people that are filled with negativity, they don't care. They're not logical. It makes no sense. The Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, pray for us that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. See, if you don't have faith, that means you're unreasonable. You're not logical and you're wicked. Mean, wicked means you're going contrary to what God said. And see, a person who's illogical and unwilling to submit to the promise of God, that person is just simply in rebellion. They are, they're like, well, we need to interpret this and find a way to make this work, uh, you know, based upon the way I do things. And, uh, you know, let's fit it into this category. Well, that worked back then, but it doesn't work now. In other words, the devil will always try to get you to be rational against what God said. But you are to hold fast to your confession of faith. You're supposed to be in possession of the God kind of faith. And you're not supposed to let the devil talk you out of what God clearly had printed for you to see and to repeat and to embrace. But see, where are you to embrace it? Up here, here, or here? In your spirit, remember that? In your spirit. Now we're looking at 1 Thessalonians, you still there? Okay, chapter five. He says in verse 18, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. Verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Verse 23, and the very God of peace, everybody say that God the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
and of my spirit is the God of peace. Now that means that he's the God of peace, prosperity, no lack in your life. God wants you blessed above measure. But notice this. He told you, don't work against him. And see, people have been trained to work against God. Something goes down, they get mad and turn against God. Some people are boycotting God by the droves. They ain't coming to church. Why? Because they're mad at God. He let them down. They're not, giving a, they're not giving one red cent to God. Why, Why would I tithe when God disappointed me? I'm dealing with these finances. Oh, Lord, you don't know nothing about this. You're not sensitive about this. See, they talk crazy to God. Why don't they talk crazy to the devil? They won't do that. But they talk crazy to God. God says, give, and I'm going to protect you and keep the devourer from devouring you. Well, you know what? I would do that, but you got to prove yourself to me first. God is like, look, I gave you breath. If I withdraw the breath, the proof is in the pudding. But see, some people have disrespect for God. And they talk crazy to God. See, your attitude when you come to the word of God has to be this. If you say it, I'm going to believe it. And because I choose to believe it, I will obey it. And I'm going to thank you for it. Now notice, he says, abstain from all appearance of evil. In verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. That word holy is W-H-O-L-L-Y, which means completely. So now notice in verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you, separate you, right? Holy, and I pray God, your whole, your complete spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole what? Spirit and soul and body. Now notice, there's not a lot of Christians that understand that. They should. I mean, you're born again. You're supposed to be more focused on your spiritual condition than your physical condition. Because if you're spiritually strong, the Bible says in the Old Testament that if your spirit is strong, it will sustain you through an infirmity. That means your body will have to respond to what your spirit has the conviction of. And if your spirit has the conviction, he sent his word and healed me and delivered me from my destruction, your body is like... You know what? I'm going to have to respond to that because the power is in the word of God. But your body will put up a fight sometimes, <laughs> many times. <laughs> your body will let you know, you know, I ain't feeling what you're going through. Huh? I tell you what, I don't feel. It's interesting. I was thinking about this earlier this morning. People will sit out in the cold to go to a football game for three and four hours, and they'll paint, paint themselves up and have the flags and all that, and they call themselves a fan. But ask them to come to church. Oh, no, no, I ain't got time for that. I got stuff I got to do. Fly around the world to go to various events. The boat shows and yacht shows and racing, you know, in France and all that kind of stuff. And go anywhere they want to go. Take some time. Come learn what God has to say concerning you getting results with your faith. No, no, I don't have time. Then they wonder when Satan jumps on them with sickness and disease, they wonder how come they can't get rid of the symptoms. Because they've never given themselves over to learning how to operate by the God kind of faith. And then the Bible says you can be strong in faith. So that means the more you learn, the more you embrace, the more you're convinced, the more you believe, the more the power of God can push off and eradicate the circumstances you have to deal with. Now note this, everybody that's a believer. The life you live as a believer, you're going to have to live it by faith. So that means the more you grow in faith, the greater your life will be. 
the greater your lifestyle will be, the greater your enjoyment of life will be. You'll have answers to questions that's perplexing the world, but for you it's like, oh, I know how to do this. It's like knowing how to work the Rubik's Cube. When you know how to use it and work it, then you know what? It doesn't matter if somebody throws you a Rubik's Cube that's all discombobulated, you be like, here. Well, I'm going to do it another way. It doesn't matter how you do it. I know how to straighten it out. See, when you have the God kind of faith mature inside of you, growing up inside of you, ooh, life is sweet. Life is wonderful. Life is enjoyable. And there's nothing the devil can throw at you that can cause you to become depressed, sad, or victimized. Because you know how to use the God kind of faith. Now they know this, and when I was talking about my cousin, my cousin and the, 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 the grandmaster, like I said, is only a handful in the world. A handful in the entire world that is at this level. He says, well, if this happens, you have other recourses. If a person says they've done this to you and they got you in a way you can't get out of, there's another way to get out of it. And what they do against you ends up hurting them. And what I'm saying to you is that God is a grand master. He's greater than a grand master martial art. He's, God is a grand master at winning. They killed Jesus and God raised him from the dead and now Jesus is the first born again man and he is the head of the body of Christ and all of us who are in him are new creatures with him. And I got to quit because I run out of time. Did you learn why we're supposed to have faith? Yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> to God be the glory. Amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm so glad we're learning and growing in the word of God. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time together. Thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. The entrance of your word gives light and revelation. Lord, as we're growing and learning the aspects of how faith works and why we as your people should walk by faith, we thank you that we can smile and have the anticipation already of victory because Lord, this is the victory that overcomes the world our faith and so thank you for giving us the God kind of faith I want to thank you for tuning in today's lesson if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior then I'm going to lead you into a confession of faith if you say these words after me you can become a child of the living God in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised it from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation let us pray these words now believing these words in our heart and saying them with our mouth dear God I believe in my heart you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was crucified. His blood was shed to wash me clean. And dear God, you raised him from the dead. So I confess with my mouth, now Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. You are alive. I believe this in my heart. And because I confess you as my Lord, I am now a child of the living God. Father, thank you for making me your very own. I will live for you. you In Jesus' so name, amen. That never goes I'd like to thank you for your continual support of this broadcast of Spirit Food Christian Center. We're so grateful for your participation. I'd like to give you an opportunity to participate by our Push Pay app. Text my SFCC to the number 77977. You'll receive further instruction on how to give. We're so grateful and thankful for your continual support and love. Remember, you're helping to make it happen. In Jesus' name, you amen. Are the sun.